Okay, you're back with another episode on Adventure Fit Radio. This one is part one of two. We're joined with Cameron McKenzie, who is a world record junior powerlifter and a high-level strength coach, uh, joins us by the name of John Chan. We talk to these guys about training, nutrition, the mental approach to a barbell, how to set PBs. Uh, Cameron is under 21 and uh, is looking to set uh, a world record uh, in the World Games coming up. This, uh, this episode is brought to you by Audible Trial. You get a free 30 days uh, trial with, with audio and you get a free audio book. You can find them at www.audibletrial.com. That's A-U-D-I-B-L-E trial.com forward slash ADF radio. Um, we're also going to promote Loxam Solutions and NDO Sups. Our sponsorship with these guys has ended, but they were our original backers of the program, and we really appreciate everything they've done for us. So we're going to give them another free plug. Loxam Solutions is a boutique consulting and business support company focused on business consulting and commercial services. The key to their success has been through the application and pro- pragmatic approach combined with entrepreneurial spirit to achieve our clients and outcomes. Their, their philosophy is simple, deliver a well-defined, measurable business outcomes to their clients through an engaged engagement of subject. The other one is NDO Sups, www.ndosups.com. Um, I have been a user and still am a user of their products. I can highly recommend the Recov by Peptides. Um, it's uh, a fantastic source of protein and branched chain amino acids. So if you're struggling to recover properly, uh, if your, uh, your skin and hair and nails is lacking, then uh, jump on that as it's a fantastic supplement. Anyway, guys, hopefully you guys enjoy the show. Speak to you soon. Alrighty, so uh, sitting here with... Cam McKenzie and John Tran, our powerlifting guests for the day. Uh, Max on my left and Tommy on my left with his guitar as usual. We'll introduce the boys shortly, but first, as always, Tommy's tribute. Alrighty, lads, welcome aboard. Um, this is a uh, one of our first segments we do where I just write up a, uh, a relatively <laughs> stupid song. I haven't really stitched you up today, so um, I felt uh, felt like I was on a on a positive vibe today. So, yeah, felt very intimidated. <laughs> so uh, please 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 enjoy. <laughs> And then Sandman cover. Tommy, you are quite intimidating. You're a big, big boy, oh, except for the calves. Except for the calves, <laughs> no calf raises in the uh, training program. Oh, that's a waste of body weight. Yeah, there is no calves. <laughs> none, none. That is disproportionate, isn't it? It's bad when you wear just shorts at the gym and they go, "Oh, you don't even train legs." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just keep leg tasting your power. Just, just, just wait till I squat. Just wait till I squat. Alrighty, cool. So. Um, why don't you guys introduce yourself? Cam, do you want to start? Tell us about your training and uh, and some of the uh, some of the feats that you've been up to the last couple of years. Um, well, I'm currently ranked number one powerlifter in Australia. Mm-hmm. Finished off last year ranked number one as well. So, uh, in terms of what I'm working toward at the moment, I've got the World Championships of powerlifting in June in Colleen, Texas. Really? Yeah, pretty Beautiful. cool. Cool. So the big goal there is to take out pound for pound number one junior in the world so anyone under 23 years of age how old are you now uh just turned 23 on tuesday great so you you like last year of juniors yeah it's my last year yeah cool how do you think you'll rank when you go to seniors next year is there a big jump um there is a 
quite a big step up. I was lucky enough to compete in the Opens at Worlds last year. Due to some funding, um, my federation helped help fund toward the comp if I went in the Opens, and I managed to play sixth in the Open Men's in the World when I was 22. Cool. Really? Yeah, so, yeah, I should hopefully be top five next year at Worlds if I'm in the Opens. Beautiful. Yeah. That's awesome. And, uh, and John, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Uh, well, my accolades list isn't as astounding as <laughs> Cameron's. Uh, basically, I own a company called City Strength. Uh, I coach powerlifters. Uh, I run powerlifting comps with my partner, Greta. Yep. Um, and I referee as well. So everything I do in my day-to-day life is powerlifting. Hmm. It's yep. slightly one-dimensional, but you know, if you can make your hobby... Part of your work and your your normal oh, life it's it's not work yeah it's, it's not work at all That's right. so um just been following powerlifting for the last five six years ish mm-hmm. and um yeah just seeing it grow especially the last three years um and that's why i started up the business to, to cater for that as well beautiful so for me i get confused a little bit with powerlifting i'm a weightlifter um i know a fair bit about crossfit i'm not huge sorry to hear that the boys the boys <laughs> every boys give me shit every, apparently every <laughs> podcast i say i'm a weightlifter every time. <laughs> um but i so there's lots of different divisions in powerlifting right mm. so there's raw um there's and then if you're assisted like with your belts and your your straps and your suits and stuff right is that yeah correct? that's equipped so there's classical raw powerlifting yep so at a competition you can wear knee sleeves and a belt yep the knee sleeves don't offer much assistance it's more a like a placebo in the yeah, mind. Sure. Whereas you're equipped powerlifting, you can wear knee wraps, a belt, but also a powerlifting suit. Yes. So it's like a almost like a seatbelt material, but more flexible. So it's like a big elastic band around your body that you can use to spring out of. Yeah, thing. spring out of and such. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And um and so there's is there also divisions as in um clean and drug assisted? Yeah. So in powerlifting, you've got the IPF, which is the International Powerlifting Federation. Yep. So they're recognised by the IOC, so the International Olympic Committee. Um, In Australia as well, we're government recognised. So we're recognised by... Australian Sports Commission. Yeah. Whereas every other federation fall under a different banner, which is untested. So they're not affiliated with ASADA on our national level or WADA on an international level. Right. Um, Yeah, cool. That's something I wanted to just clear up because... um, it's it's strange. So uh, most of the uh, most of the good athletes and the and uh, the competitive nature. It's obviously in the in the clean area of the sport. Who's competing in? Is that fair to say? Who's competing in the in the non tested? Oh, guys that it, get popped. That at work. Yeah, people that oh, without without getting into sounding too unpolitical. The people that don't have the time or the patience to see where they can take themselves naturally or drug free. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So sometimes you get people that have attempted to complete compete drug free that get tested and they get tested positive. Yeah. So they have no other choice but get suspended and move to the untested federation. Mm-hmm. Do you find there's a high amount of people, a uh, high percent of people that do that, try and get away with uh, being on drugs in the clean uh, league? Yeah, every year you get a few here and there in Australia. On an international level, they've got quite a long list of people all around the world that attempt to compete on drugs and they get caught out. So the drug testing does work. You can't always catch all of them, but yeah, there's quite a high number of people that do try and do it, which is quite sad. And what's your reason why they would do that rather than just go straight into the uh, the the you know uh, the drug allowed one and, and just up their doses and be a machine? Honestly, I don't know. I think they just want to take out first place no matter yeah, what. For sure. Right. I think it's, yeah, it's, whether it's egotistical or not. People want to cheat. Yeah, people want to cheat. They want to win. They don't want to do it the hard way, the honest way, which is sad. But Do you think they're trying to hide the fact that they're on drugs as well? Oh, absolutely. So they yeah. everyone they're clean? I know of, know of people that have taken small doses to have that slight edge. Yeah. yeah. They get caught out. They shift to the other side of the realm and then they go, they go all out. Yeah. There's no, there's no real. It's obviously not a clean sport, and then a, a drug assisted sport. It's just, yeah, an option for the people that have been busted. That's right. There's always going to be people out there that want that. We had this discussion last night. We were talking about um, weightlifting because weightlifting mm. changed the um, weight categories a couple of decades yep. ago because it was so the, the sport was so dirty. And then now, so they've got all the new, all the old world records still stand. We've got all these new world records, and I mean, I haven't 
popped anyone on for drugs myself, but you know, a lot of them are. It's still it's still rampant. So, what well, are the numbers like? Uh, same uh, weight category from say the the number one uh, non drug and then the number one drug assisted. Oh, they vary actually. Yeah, it's some yeah. there's some drug free lifters like a Russian lifter Sergei Fedsienko. He's it's a tiny person, but he's just one of those freaks of nature. He's one in he's just better every than hundred million. I would you would yeah. say. That's just better than everyone, yep. regardless of drugs or not. Yep. Where yep. you get people like the heavyweight guys that... And it also comes down to, the way I see it is, it doesn't separate skill or talent at that level without drugs. Mm. Or with drugs, sorry. It's more so who's got more balls to take more drugs. Mm. They can put more in their system. They're going to get stronger. Yeah. Right. Mm. So it's a combination of all those things, really. Yeah. If you look at the stats, uh, just off the top of my head, like generally... Uh, it's a bit of a mixed bag at the top level. Like it's just because the drug assisted lifters doesn't mean they're necessarily at the top of their game. Like it's quite yeah. there's quite a few um, clean lifters who uh, who top that list. Who are just way more skilled and way more talented. Mm. Yeah, when you when you're up there, um, I think it's if if you're not if you're not at the elite level without drugs, you're never going to be elite anyway. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Have you have you ever been approached by anyone oh, coming yeah. through the ranks? Lots of people you bet you would have been training around, and uh, and you would have been you would see it a lot, right? Um, you, you for me, I, I I train in a pretty segregated part of the country in Newcastle, yeah. where powerlifting's got a really big sport. There's no powerlifting style gyms with powerlifting clubs. Gotcha. So I train by myself in the middle of the day between my split shift for work. Right. So I, I I don't see it. I have been offered in the past. People say, "Oh, you should jump on board and take drugs and mm-hmm. come to this federation and so on and so forth," but it. I've got no interest for it. Yeah. For me, nothing replaces hard work. Is there more money involved? Like, what? what's the temptation at, you know, your age and with your skill ability, why would you jump federations? I don't know. There's, there, there like is, like they're, there not, is, they're not waving, you know, $100,000 in front of your face or anything like that? I guess or? it's just being able to say I'm stronger than this person or that yep. person. There is no real benefit, which is why I've stayed where I am and yep. I'm doing what I'm doing. That's good. That's great. So, um, so what does a day? I ask you, John. What does a day of programming look like for your average, your um, for your athletes that you coach? What does a day of programming look like in a powerlifting gym? Oh, uh, so it depends on the level of lifter. So if they're a real beginner, um, usually they have always have main lifts, which are either depending where they are in their training program, how far away they're from competition, or might be a variation of a competition lift Mm -hmm. Uh, and they'll do especially for beginners they have to learn the skills to be able to do the competition lifts so they'll do competition lifts and variations of just to learn the skill set and also build some hypertrophy build some muscle um, and then goes on from there so the more intermediate more advanced ones will do more competition lifts and less variations variations such as box squats and floor press rather than you know your your full squat and bench press Yeah, yeah 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 Although I don't have much use for box squats, not for raw power. I was just trying to think of variations. Yeah, so like things like uh, front squats will be probably the first variation I give them. Mm-hmm. Like a high bar squat uh, will yep. be another one, um, and then variations of tempos and pauses, depending on what the person needs to work on. So, so it's not really so much accessory exercises. You you use the full exercise. Oh, we're talking about the squat right now, but just in yep. different forms. Yeah. So, so, so how do you manage? Um, with training um, in powerlifting, how do you manage the central nervous system stress? Obviously, with squatting and pulling so much. Well, surprisingly, like a lot of pe- people can handle quite a bit. I mean, if you yeah. manage, um, you know, their sleep firstly and their dietary intake, they can consume enough calories. Then the only thing as a coach, you need to understand how much your athlete or lifter can handle in terms of training volume. Yeah. Once you sort of establish that, then you've got a sort of set point that you can you can manage. And, and track along you, as, as, as they progress along. You'd be amazed what the human body can handle. Yeah, it's, sure. like, it's like any sport, your body just adapts. It's, it's incredible because the load I put my body through, even at the moment, I'm getting up every morning going, I don't know how I'm handling yeah. this, this stress through training, but 
if you do every every other little thing right, then it's just it just adapts. Yeah. Have sure. you guys used any apps to assist you at all? At all? Um, there's a couple of apps out there that measure your heart rate and variability. Do you guys are you guys aware of that? Yeah, I've I've seen that and I've I've looked into it. Yeah. But being the the arrogant athlete I am, <laughs> where I go, I can. Who I can, needs rest? <laughs> who needs rest? <laughs> now I'm a big I'm a big believer in the simple things where lifters back in the day 70s 80s despite the drugs they worked hard and recovered ate well and if you do the little things like sleep diet it all should come together like a puzzle piece it's just those little things here and there that you need to tweak and adjust yeah. so stuff like that is always an extremely useful tool mm-hmm. yeah i agree i mean the, the hrv does give you like a quantifiable measurement but ultimately i feel my job as a coach is to get to know your lifter and if they move a certain way when they're training in the gym or they look a certain way, then it's your job to question it or get to know your lifter. Understand that, you know, the way they're squatting today or the way they're moving today is not, not like how they normally are. Find out what that problem is. Might have been a really bad day at work, not enough sleep, mm-hmm. God knows what, because you've only got them for those mm-hmm. couple of hours during the day. So getting to know your lifter, understanding that, you know, they're a lot more fatigued than otherwise and then adjusting the training session as a result. Uh, so how often would you go by feel versus percentage? In percentages in so up and down through through your week. So yep. if if you have Cam here and he's uh, tired, lethargic, whatever he is, showing symptoms of stress, uh, would you go then by feel, or if you are bang, you need to be at eighty five percent no matter what, you go on eighty five percent. Well, there's multiple considerations, depending on what shape he's in, how far away from competition. So understanding that. You know, so for example, we would have, say, we'll say eighty-five percent projected for this training session, but he's an absolute wreck, and he turns it, turns up at this training session. We can't at this particular stage. We can't risk injury or whatever. Then I might drop the intensity or the volume depending on what needs to be done for the end goal. Yeah. It's like having, the, the the end goal dictates how you go about it. It's yeah. having a set plan, but being intuitive, adjusting where it need be to avoid injury, but also get the necessary stress to initiate an adaptation. That's the critical thing is avoiding injury, but adapting and improving at the same time. So it's having the plan of being intuitive. Yeah. So do you have any um, do you have any things outside of the kind of outside of the box that you do for recovery, prehab, rehab, and stuff? Like obviously, flotation tanks are becoming all the rage. I think they're actually quite good. I've used them a lot. Um, saunas. Uh, what do you do outside of you know massage and general maintenance yourself? Do you have any specific tools or people you go see? For your rehab? Um, I've got a powerlifting specific physio, Jack, from Terrace Physio Plus. So he's up in Newcastle. Yep. He um he treats me on a weekly basis due to a great sponsorship and we partner up and do a lot of different projects together. Cool. But he's I'm really big on dry needling and right. a lot of manual therapy, but I think that's especially with the CNS response through the muscle tissue, I think it's a really valuable tool. Mm-hmm. Otherwise I do steam room as well just to Pull the like, pull the moisture out and get some blood flow through the body as well. Yeah. Otherwise, it's just a lot of foam rolling, trigger pointing, and yep. and it's just basic rest and nutrition. So, how much time do you think in the week you would spend um, on your recovery? Because this, I think, is where a lot of people that are trying to take their sport seriously, whether it's CrossFit, weightlifting. Did I mention I'm a weightlifter? <laughs> Powerlifting. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> any, any, <laughs> any, uh, any, sport, any sport out there, I think there's a lot of people that can't really bridge the gap between being an amateur um, amateur in their sport and taking that next step because they don't really look after their recovery. I've been guilty of it 100%, not, not, look, uh, not looking after myself well enough and I had a back injury for a long time. So it took me out of the sport for like 18 months of competing or 20 months. So... Just to put into perspective for people, how many hours a week do you have to put in to keep your body able to uh, hold up with the rigors of powerlifting? So for me, I train seven days a week. Yep. Pre-session, I spend probably 20 to 30 minutes yep. uh, pre-having, so foam rolling, trigger pointing, mm-hmm. stretching, so on and so forth. Post-training, it might be 10 minutes of just a light stretch. So it's like just basic cool down. Yep. So that's already three and a half hours a week yeah. of that pre-training or post-training, if not more. Mm-hmm. And then there's one to two hours of physiotherapy treatment per week. Yep. And then the countless hours of doing little bits here and there. So probably yeah, minimum six to ten hours. Yep. Minim- that's minimum. Some weeks yeah, are more. For sure. 
yeah let alone the actual hours you're putting in in the gym yeah i think that's um that's a big one so i just wanted to pick your brain and see if you guys had any mm. any do you have any any um anything that you well, like to use Sean? the things things i emphasize with my lift is number one apart from all the what cameron does like the trigger point release and everything else yeah is sleep yeah for recovery you can't you can't out diet sleep you can't you mm. can you can steam yourself with caffeine and everything else but you, it's still a still piss poor performance if you if you don't have enough sleep for sure. so you can you can go without a meal and still have a semi decent training session yeah. if you don't sleep well it's it's gone down to gurgler mm-hmm. i think a lot of people like you said were wondering about how to make that transition to take their sport more seriously they can manage sleep that's probably the most important one yep. then is diet yeah. People, yeah, you, know, you get. I'm sure you guys have had all been asked the question about, like, what supplements to take, and people are looking for the the quick fix or the one magic pill, mm-hmm. but they forget about diet. Like, diet has one of the biggest influences on the up and coming training session, sure. and you know, recovery from that training session to get the the adaptations that you want. Mm-hmm. And it's probably if you eat real food, whole food, it's probably cheaper yeah. than buying supplements. So, sleep and diet. Also, I send all my competitive athletes to a sports dietitian. Uh, I'll give them a rough guideline and if they want to take that step further then send them off to a sports dietitian. That's one thing I always say to my clients is why would you spend some people spend up to $300 on a a stack at their supplement store I go well you can spend all that money on fucking real good quality food. Yeah, after your quality buy more of it. You're buying a multivitamin when you could be buying like incredible fruit and veggies which are doing the same job but you're getting the fiber nutrients hydration Yep. everything else from them as well i mean you're skipping the necessary basics are there to supplement what you can't already get yeah i think most people forget like trying to make another transition to take their sport more seriously they almost have to have a more professional approach you think of it as a as you know more everyone everyone has the same hours in a day and the more advanced you get as an athlete you need to dedicate more time in hours a day. something else has got to give mm. so unfortunately uh time with family are prioritizing training over staying overtime at work and things like that. That's just fact. You yeah. just have to do more mm. to get better or dedicate more of it to, to, to get better at your sport. Yeah. And that's or like just not going to get better. That's it's it. Just, that's it's hard it. Enough. Exactly. So what about um this is a, a a thing to touch on with nutrition. So there's a lot of talk of good nutrition here. Um, we had uh one of our one of our listeners, Erin, who wanted to start this conversation, I suppose, with a question uh, she she wanted me to ask uh, or us to ask why does the sport have a negative connection to unhealthy foods and I use the example oh. of donuts and deadlifts oh man in, in, the, <laughs> get, in the USA get, get ready for a rant <laughs> yeah oh I'm ready bring it on what do you what do you <laughs> okay. think I mean because Just go, okay. give me some donuts really it's a, it's, a, <laughs> it's 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 popular you know it's a popular thing to to go and work out and then post Instagram photos eating burgers. donuts at the donut shop burgers yeah. you know all this all this stuff so tell us your thoughts cover my ass before I rant I'm going to say balance is key you always need balance in everything you do but I'm so fucking sick of the unhealthy diet affiliated with powerlifting yeah all these big powerlifters these big fat guys they go I was at a training course one day and I started at powerlifting they went but you're not fat what no no I'm not <laughs> is <that> right? <laughs> can I stay I'm strong as fuck <laughs> yeah. I'll squat the fuck out of you man yeah. <laughs> but people people think powerlifters to be this fat unhealthy sport where they just try and lift the heaviest weight they can yeah but for a lot of us it's about athleticism um it's it's more than just lifting heavy weight it's being treating ourselves like an athlete so it's yeah. eating the right foods at the right time so macronutrient uh, macronutrient timing composition so the types of food you're eating when you're eating them what they're composed of mm-hmm. i'm not just saying oh fuck i do powerlifting i'm just gonna go eat burgers and donuts and mm. post that they're doing it and a lot of those athletes that do it probably do eat great food but to all the beginners out there that are watching them that are looking at them as role models go oh fuck well if they're doing it i can go eat i can go eat six donuts after i train but the stress they can put their body through is not the same as their role models and they don't see the the good stuff no they don't get to see it that's not exciting yeah it's not exciting to see on instagram that's right so i often i often um post some of the food i put on like i consume on instagram or facebook and people go that's boring and i've had people say (laughs) That looks boring. <laughs> unfollow. And, well, you, sorry to bore you. vegetables, unfollow. <laughs> you like are pretty the, boring, mate. Some of the people take the piss and go, where are the donuts? <laughs> yeah. Whereas other lifters in Australia, some notable lifters as well, put burgers up on a, almost a daily basis. Yep. And it creates this false interpretation of what a power lifter is. And, and for me, it pisses me off. Mm. 
Because to me, I look at myself as an elite athlete. Yep. And elite athletes should nourish their bodies. And in saying that, they should always be balanced. We're not robots, but yeah, it yeah. it just pisses me off, and it's it just yeah infuriates me. Yeah, like you said, like the things that stand out most on Instagram are usually the post comp meal, mm. where they've gone, yep, I've I've done you know sixteen weeks of, of prepping for this comp or six months of prepping for this comp. I want at it. That's it. It's done. And it's the, you know, the photo of the ginormous triple Wagyu patty burger yeah. with thick shake and everything else. But they don't show the, the photos of the food they're consuming when they're cutting weight to cut down, drop yeah. whatever weight necessary to make that to make that competition. The, whether it be chicken and broccoli or the lean meals of rice and salad or chicken or steak, lean meats and stuff. It's what looks appealing and will get the Instagram likes or the mm. Facebook likes and the social media attention. Yeah. So... With yourself, your weight category is uh, one hundred and twenty kilo males. One hundred and twenty, and your so you have to do you have to cut weight or you what what do you walk around at? So for a long time, for the three years I was in juniors prior to now, I was weighing about one hundred and sixteen kilos thereabouts. Yeah. Um, I took a heavy approach in just consuming a caloric excess about September last year, mm-hmm. so consuming a lot more protein and healthy fats. Yep, and I just packed on a lot of like a bit of fat but also quite a lot of muscle mass yep to the point where i got up to 127 kilos and i recently just did a big water cut down with a little bit of dieting so i competed at 120 about five weeks ago Mm -hmm. so at the moment i'm about 125 on a daily basis okay cool and that's a pretty comfortable cut that's pretty easy to get down from 125 rather than 127 it's not too bad yeah, I was drinking 12 litres of water for three yeah. to four days. So I felt like... I was, <laughs> 12 so litres of water? It wasn't fun. Yeah. It was prescribed by uh, John Paul Couch, a real good uh, lifter in Melbourne. He does a lot of weight cuts for a lot of people and I trust his judgment. He's mm-hmm. got a bachelor's degree in applied science and so on. So, so you feed you feed your body full of water and then you starve it for the last day or two, right? Is that how it works? Yeah, so you, you trick your body, um, mm. like trick your body's hormones for holding water to consume all this water, then load up on salt, then your body just dumps everything when you stop consuming it. Yeah, right. Yeah, so I lost six kilos in about five days. Wow. Yeah, so I felt like I was drowning on the inside. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned before you went, you, you, I'd seen a sports dietitian. What's roughly your macros for the day? Um, so John recommends people see a dietitian. I don't actually count macros. Mm-hmm. I'm, I believe in being really intuitive in all aspects of training and performance. So I don't count. I kind of I kind of keep in mind my protein intake, but I kind of eat when I can as well because with my busy lifestyle, being a PT up in Newcastle, it's sometimes if I've got clients back-to-back for five hours, I've got to eat where I can and catch up mm-hmm. macros and so on. So I, I eat intuitively and eat to recover yep. largely. So what's your pre- and post-workout meal consist of? Um, pre-training probably an hour before it's a steak with some sweet potato or some rice and some veggies, just real, real basic food or it might be, um, just some eggs on toast, but post, post, uh, training session, I'll consume a liter of milk, liter of light milk. Light milk? Yeah. Why light yeah. Milk? It's a diet. For me, because I have to drink a lot of calories to keep my body weight up, mm-hmm. I get a lot of them through milk. So I yep. drink three to four liters of light milk a day. But why? Yep. Why light? Why not uh, whole full fat? Because full fat just gets to my stomach, okay. and I can't handle as much of it. If I can yep. drink light milk to drink the protein, gotcha. it's not so much about the like the fats through the whole milk. I know whole milk's great, but for me, if I just need to get the protein and the carbs in, it's quite cheap and quite easy to get it through light milk. Well, that's cool. So it's easier on easier on your stomach. Oh, heaps easier. It's like it's like water, with. whereas full cream is even in my. I can feel how cream it is in my mouth. It's quite yeah. hard for me to handle three to four liters a day. Yeah, because I've I've done the same thing from time to time. I've um, upped my milk intake to three or four kilos, and people freak out. They're like, oh, three or four that. kilos of milk. Uh, tr- liters. Liters. Yeah. Right. Say <laughs> 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 hey, liters, liters a kilo. Same yeah, thing. No, same thing. So yeah. So I just said it a really weird way, but um. A lot of people struggle. That's actually a pretty good tip, I think, for people because a lot of people, it's such a great um, and easy source of oh yeah your macros and cheap and cheap. That's right. And but a lot of people have that you know that problem with lactose and they they can't. I say to someone, oh yeah, I've been drinking three or four liters of milk because I don't have a problem with it at all. So I don't no, me either. Yeah, but but I, and I, I'm able to drink full full cream. I think people 
it's just a good thing to know that Absolutely. you know to use just the protein and the, ca- the carb aspect of the mm. milk and it's probably going to be a lot more digestible for for people so and for me to keep enough calories elsewhere in my diet to consume like the rice or protein or carbs elsewhere instead of getting or even like avocado nuts healthy fats yeah. well fats are easy to get yeah they're easy like to get macadamia, but i don't want... i've got always always say i've got a ma- bag of macadamia nuts with me yeah at all well, that's exactly right you know, boom handful in and then you're you're on because you're not you go to the cafe you're not always going to be able to get avocado and everything or mm. you're right no you're right fats but it's so easy to just have them lying around in your car or... yeah but even milk duck down the road of the servo and get a bottle of milk it's it's cheap it's easy and yeah yeah for me it's a big part of my diet for sure so what about all this talk of the good stuff you you do have cheap meals though i imagine yeah every now and then and what what do you what do you use as a cheap meal and how how do you how do you how do you program it into your diet so to speak i've so i came from a bodybuilding background i did yep. only one comp as a natural athlete when i was 18 yep so when I did that, I was really strict. I would give myself the one cheat meal a week where I would sit down and go nuts. Yep. So now it's very much like that. I'll just eat good food, like not super strict where it's bland, boring meals, but I'll be pretty strict all week eating what I need to eat. Yep. And it's usually a Friday or a Saturday night. I'll go out with my partner and have a big burger or a pizza or a pasta or whatever. And, yeah, cool. And then go nuts at the movies and... Get like chocolates and Ice soft drink and, and stuff. Yeah, just bang it in. Give just myself live. like a two to three hour window, and after that window's done, it's back to business. Yep, yeah, that's good. Um, and by so, the and by the end of it, I'm <laughs> I don't want to eat anymore. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So I mean, it's so so important the um, nutrition and and the ability to recovery uh, recover just by getting the right amount of calories in. Um, just going back to recovery and kind of injuries. Have you guys um, have you guys dealt with any any major injuries? In, yeah. your, in your lifting careers? Yeah. A uh, couple of... I had two bulging discs and an annular tear. So, didn't know what was what was going on. Just prepping for a comp. Knee was flaring up. Hip was flaring up. Didn't get any back pain, funnily enough. So, yeah. did the comp. And then, for whatever reason, body just went, yeah, you know what? I've held, <laughs> held on for long enough. And it's all let go. Yeah. Goodbye. And uh, <laughs> nothing... That's the thing. I'd never got any back spasm. It, was, it felt... The sensation was down one side like into the glute and the hammy and it sort of feel like a tight hammy or tight glute so you, you know you get the ball roll it out whatever. didn't make any difference yeah. <sighs> much to my detriment left it for four or five months training was up and down mostly down and then uh, a friend of mine suggested go get an MRI it sounds like a nerve thing so yeah yeah whatever went to the GP asked for an MRI practically almost had to threaten him with violence <laughs> even though I said I'll pay for it. I don't care about bulk billing, whatever. Went and got MRI, found out two bulging discs and your tear. Oh my God, it's in the world. I can't lift ever again. Yeah. Uh, went to a sports physio um, and basically, because I couldn't do anything else, all I could do was the rehab stuff because it made it feel better. I uh, just knuckled down and just rehabbed it for, I think it was eight to 12 weeks, about three months. And I was back to deadlifting. So I think I got off lucky because I only had real pain for probably about a month where people have had months on end of not being and able to tie the shoelace. Did you think, I've had the exact same injury by the way, that's what kept me out for a little while, but did you, when, did you get um, prognosis from doctors that said, right, you're done? Yeah. You're done with the sport? How'd that, how'd you feel when you heard that? Uh, I sort of, exp- I sort of went in there expecting that yep. and he delivered yep. right on the money. Mm-hmm. Uh, had I not had the previous experience of training other people getting the same prognosis from doctors or whatever, I probably would have packed it up yeah. and just said, you know, I'm just going to watch Jerry Springer. What's yeah. the easy option, it. isn't it? Yeah. Listen, listen yeah. If, if your average average person got told by a GP uh, that exactly, they'd probably take it on board and go, yeah, that's it. I'll hang up my lifting shoes and they'll, they'll be the end of it. Mm. But well, We see it all the time at my gym. Yeah. Oh, doctor said I can't do anything yeah. for the next six months just because they've done something to their knee. Well, mm. it's not about your upper body. Like yeah. they just wipe it out completely. Yeah, yeah there are alternatives. Yeah, I got told twice, um, two different. With my MRI, I got asked if I'd been in a major trauma, car accident, or something. So I had two bulging discs and a torn disc in my lumbar, and and then their first doctor was like, "Yeah, you'll never be able to lift again. Um, you shouldn't be squatting below parallel anyway." As soon as she said that, I'm like, "Oh well, I'm, I'm fucking out of here." See yeah. you later. Thanks for time. And then, um, so do you even lift? Yeah. yeah. And then. <laughs> and then um, Got a second opinion, and that was the same. <clears throat> then I went and saw a sports psychologist, a uh, sports um, sports doctor who was the head doctor for um, 
Carlton Football Club in the AFL. Oh, and, and he was like, he goes, mate, 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 you're good to go. We'll just, we just strengthen you up. We'll give you the, the right amount of time off so the scar tissue will heal. We'll do the right things. You'll be, you'll be fine. Um, yeah, so what did you actually, what rehab procedures did you go through though for, so, for a back injury like that? Went through, uh, well, I did a lot of release work, dry needling initially because it was all spasmed up and tightened at that stage. Yep. And funny enough, he had the same response that your sports doctor had a bit of a chuckle yeah. and just said, nah, should be right. Yeah, we're should just, right. just got to work on it. That's right, give it time. <laughs> yeah. Get the collars out, get the collars, yeah. bring those plates out, let's have a go. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Um, Get the concrete out of the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> you and your concrete. <laughs> um, basically, regressed all my exercise. He actually analyzed uh, my deadlift, which was causing me the most grief and yep. going nowhere. And then broke, down, broke it down, regressed it all the way right back to a kneeling position. Yep. Um, followed a lot of McKenzie uh, practices, like McKenzie press-ups. And he'll be doing these things called uh, baby rolls. Okay. So... For example, one of the exercises was lying. Then, mind you, this is after all the inflammation and all the all the pain had died down. Lying face down on the ground, arms outstretched like an overhead position, legs out yep. the bottom, uh, and I had to roll onto my back. Uh, first exercise was doing it with the legs, so no upper back, is, uh, upper body assistance at all. So I had to throw my leg back and roll over, and bring it back. Mm-hmm. And then the hard bit was doing the same with just upper body, just using your arms to roll and roll back right. on both sides. Um, and that, funnily enough, that was the hardest thing to do. If anyone anyone gives it a go, if you've yeah. got any like structural imbalances, that will bring it up, especially yeah. if you've got like left or right, uh, like left shoulder, right hip and vice versa, mm-hmm. that, that'll bring it up. But that was doing those and eventually that turned into like the warm up for when I was allowed to deadlift again. Yep. That made heaps of difference. Yeah, cool. What about you, Cam? You had any major injuries? Um, I only had I only had one semi-major injury. Just had a pinched nerve in my somewhere in my lumbar spine. It was in my first year of powerlifting too, because I was progressing so quickly, lifting heavy yeah. weights. Yeah. Body just I just lifted one heavy weight. It was the last actually the last heavy rep of my whole training cycle before mm-hmm. an international competition. Right. That just sucks. pinched and everything went white for a bit and couldn't really lean over and I was on my back for about three days with my knees at 90 degrees mm. went to the physio she went oh no nah, glutes are just jacked up and protecting your spine because your spine's going uh-uh, no 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 can't do anything we don't want to get more injured yeah so I just did heaps of glute work a bit of like a bit of rotation work through the spine and I was fine in about five to six days went to the competition a few days later well that's good but otherwise <laughs> pretty, I'll, pretty lucky then hey yeah well I've, I've it was two weeks out that I did the injury and in the days while I was laying on my back just trying to not move, I got a call from Robert Wilkes, the head of Palatine Australia, saying, do you want to compete in the invitational right. competition? Can you pull a world record of 320 kilos? Yeah, I'm ready to go. And here, I, here I am going... Oh. 320 kilos? Yeah, so I was, um, I was 19 at the time. I weighed 106 or 7 kilos, something oh, yeah. like that. Yeah. Wow. So I was just a junior, yeah, and I um, got the call. I thought, oh, I can't miss this opportunity. So I said, yeah, yeah, I can do it. I can do it. I got the phone I'm on my Oh, fuck, what am I doing? What is doing? <laughs> Give me the concrete. <laughs> yeah, wait, where is it? Where is it? Yeah, so I took the rehab really seriously. The physio said, you'll be fine and we'll work on it. I was there for three or four days in a row getting her, getting her help and, yeah, pulled the world record. So, But otherwise... I've had no major injuries, always little niggles and aches yeah. and pains like every athlete would, but yeah. through proper treatment, through my physio and all the recovery I do, I'm, I'm always getting over it, I'm working through it, I'm working around it. Beautiful. So we'll throw to Tommy in a sec, but before we do, so um, do you still hold that world record? No, the world record got bumped up and up, so uh. it's currently held by a guy who's no longer a junior, but a yep. Finnish lifter. Pulled three hundred and sixty-two point five. Really? Yeah. So um, three hundred and twenty was the was the record the original record. record. That was the standard. So before it gets set, they have a set standard that yep. you have to lift to establish the record. So I hit the standard in my first comp. Yep. Well, in the the first international meet. Yeah. So I've recently pulled um, over eight hundred pounds, so three sixty-five in training. So yep. I'm looking to take the deadlift and the total on record. So. Here I, am put, here I am putting it, putting this, it out Is there. this at? This is in Texas. In Texas. Oh, the yeah, so I'm looking to total nine, 900 kilos at 120. 
which will be the highest Wilkes total of any junior in raw history. Right. Wow. Fingers, fingers crossed. Yeah, Good yeah, luck, yeah. Good luck. That'll be great. Break a leg. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> um, hey, uh, for everyone at home, we've uh, we've only got um, uh, we're what we want short mic. So um, Macca and I are currently changing um, through and through. So I, I haven't been asleep, guys. Um, well, not for not for the whole time anyway. No, I've been around. Um, hey, lads, this is um, one of the segments we do on the show: the good, the bad, and the science. We like to bring up um, something current. Um, on a positive note, um, some of the same in the negative, and then something real sciencey, um, just to throw a massive bell curve in there, <laughs> or a ball curve. I don't know the word I'm looking for is. <laughs> some sort of ball. Um, so let's talk uh, NBA. You guys fans of basketball at all? You follow the NBA at all? Yeah, well, it's been all over social media yesterday. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, um, very, very loosely. Okay, very loosely. Yeah, <laughs> I'm probably um, more on your level, but um, Bill was uh, kicking me to get this one out there today, so. We'll talk uh, Golden State Warriors um, with oh, old mate yeah. Kobe Bryant. Well, you, who do you go for, Bill? Uh, oh, I just follow... I'm a, You're a weightlifter, call, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> people call me a bandwagoner because I just follow whoever LeBron James p- plays for, but that's legit. I watched um, Michael Jordan retire the year before LeBron James started, and right. I watched um, LeBron's first game, and he had um, his first pass was a half-court... His first touch was a half-court alley-oop to his teammate. Um, he scored 25, 12, and eight boards or something and then I was mm. like right this dude's he's the next best ever he's legit yeah so I've just I've just fired LeBron basically I just want to see him on pinnacle with Jordan at the end because I get the feeling that people are very much other LeBron or Kobe fans are there they're, mm, they're, they're people that are sort of like why is that what's the what's the deal there um, well Kobe was just definitely because <laughs> he was the closest thing to Jordan yeah you know he's he's 90% of Jordan uh, which and probably 80% of Jordan he's a he's a carbon copy just not as good um, <laughs> well, no one, no one what is. a cop out well, well, no, well, no, one, well no one is you know no yeah. one's as big as good I'll just get cope on the phone <laughs> it's better than me he's, he's a pal he's probably been me one, one on one yeah. but um, Kobe was just a, I think everyone just compares compares basketballers to, to Jordan like, mm. Tim Duncan's won five championships now been around for 20 years playing at a consistent level mm. you, people should be talking about him as the greatest ever mm. but everyone just compares a like for a like and everyone wants another Michael Jordan yeah. you know, and Kobe was you know Kobe was the closest thing and you know 10 years ago when Kobe had still a lot of his career to go you never knew whether he was going to have 5 more MVPs and 6 finals MVPs and 6 more championships you never really knew so people were still thinking he could end up being the greatest mm. greatest ever do you, do you guys who do you, who do you follow uh, mate in the oh, I don't really follow much American sport I'm a big rugby league rugby yep. union fan yep. growing up where I grew up so yeah, yeah. I just see all the highlights from people on social media, and yeah, look, um, look, some of the the article said, uh, so the win, so this was the Golden State Warriors win. The win saw them break a record previously thought unbreakable. It was their seventy third regular yeah. season win, overtaking the mark of seventy two set by Michael Jordan's Chicago Bulls wow. in nineteen ninety five ninety six. Do you really think that they want another Michael Jordan though, or do you think the legacy of Michael Jordan is that no one will ever be better than him? I think you'll always have the legacy. Mm. Whether an athlete's is great, they'll always compare him to... Yeah. It, I, I guess the equivalent would be rugby league where they compare Jonathan Thurston to Andrew Jones yeah. or... Yeah. Uh, yeah, although... Yeah, Gary Ablett and all those other, other incredible players from the past, Peter Sterling. Yep. All those guys, yep. no matter how good they are, they'll always be compared to their predecessor. Yeah, yeah definitely. Definitely. Yep, that's, that's a pretty bloody good answer there. Um... Let's move on to the bad. There was this earthquake that uh, struck the city in Japan. The magnitude 7.3 quake hit at a depth of 10 kilometers in the Kyushu region last uh, Friday afternoon, uh, depending on when you are listening to this, guys. A tsunami warning obviously was issued. Japan sits directly on a fault line, but strict building codes mean that tremors rarely cause widespread damage. My question was, this is a bit of a tangent, but have you ever guys ever experienced an earthquake or been in a similar situation? I remember one time I was uh, playing Crash Bandicoot with my mate, and um, this was like two weeks ago. PS1. Yeah, no, PS, uh, PS1, yeah, PS1. Yeah. And um, oh, we were sitting upstairs um, in Melbourne, and then I just heard this, oh, what the fuck was that, man? It's like, oh, man, I don't know. And then I'm um, like, Dad, did you hear that? And he's like, yeah, it was a fucking earthquake. And I, I lost my shit. I was breaking out <laughs> real bad. And it was apparently, it was like a 0.03 <laughs> quake. So I couldn't imagine myself in a 7.3. I'd probably kill myself. <laughs> <laughs> Getting quick. Yeah, I'd just get it done. Have you guys ever been in a situation like that? Right, the closest thing I ever got was, 
I was a, I think I was still in primary school. Isn't it Newcastle Quake? Yes, yeah, Newcastle. Using, using Quake. Uh, this was up, in up Sydney, and being a young kid, I was, I was like, oh, earth shaking. That's funny. What's going on? And then the news, <laughs> like, and, yeah. news at night, you know, there's. Go with it. <laughs> yeah, go with it. And then you find the out news at night, shake. there's all things that collapse in Newcastle and, and whatever. So that that's. Like, what was that quake? What what was the rating? That was like seven or eight. Oh, that's seven. a quake. It was yeah, a legit quake, quake, but it felt, quake. felt it in yeah, Sydney. Yeah, like destroyed a... our... Destroyed it. Newcastle, yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah really. What, was... what year was this? 1980 something. Yeah, it was in the 80s. 89 yeah. or something. You remember that? <laughs> <laughs> Not that old, mate. <laughs> I am. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, that's, Sorry, that's interesting. <laughs> so so your first thought was just, oh, okay, that's interesting, as opposed to alarm bells. Yeah, nothing nothing clicked that it was an action earthquake. Yeah. Like, it was, it was uh, ground shaking. Ground shaking. It's like, oh, well. It's really weird, yeah. isn't it? Is it a keep, that? I know. I mean, I've experienced a really <laughs> Keep riding life. the bike, chasing the dog and whatever. Mm. And it wasn't the news came on, it sort of clicked. Yeah, oh, that's yeah. Crazy. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah. I had a, um, it must be cold, it's shivering. I had a, yeah, that's right. <laughs> when I was in Guatemala once, I forgot to, when you mentioned this before, mm. I we felt a tiny little tiny little tremor because they get earthquakes all the time in, mm. um, in Central America. I was in are they Guatemala. on a fault line? They are, aren't they? Um, or they're close, really close. That's the one that connects up through to California. To North America, yeah. Yeah, yeah that yeah. one. San Andreas. Yeah. Yes. yeah. San Andreas. There's heaps of stuff yeah. about they're going to get oh. a mega, mega quake. Yeah, two they're, they're, they're two, two, fault line, two fault lines are going to go. They're going to get like a mega quake apparently. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, you, you, you hear things like that and you're like, what the would you choose to live there? You would just be oh. selling up straight away. Yeah, I'd be. I'd be see you later. And I'd, those all those movies lately about like, especially like Hollywood, mm. just like the whole thing splitting in <laughs> yeah, half. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Like <laughs> one thousand <laughs> meter high waves. But wait, you have to jump across as it's splitting them. apart. Yeah, that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> make it a game. Yeah. Crash Bandicoot. <laughs> Sorry, Bill. No, that's all right. I was um I was just gonna say I was, I was sitting in a um tour um tour provider store and there was a little tremor and some um some concrete because the buildings are pretty shoddy some concrete fell in the desk in front of me from the roof above ah. just like <laughs> like a, just like a couple of little little and I was like fuck uh, yeah. I just ran on the street <laughs> <laughs> I wonder so I really wonder if this is a weightlifting powerlifting thing because you and I are both kind of weightlifters and we freak the fuck out at like a tiny little quake and then we got old mate over here and it's just <laughs> oh yeah it's a quake and it was about 14.3 on the Richter scale <laughs> oh my um, we'll move on to the science. <laughs> Scientists have managed to create mice with a gene mutation found in some humans who stutter and have discovered that the mice also stuttered. So they've um, they mutated the mice, they put this gene, or they manipulated some sort of um, thing with the As gene. As they were allowed to just mutate mice, just yeah. fuck with them. But yeah. there's like animal cruelty, like, you know, don't fuck with this animal, or don't fuck with this animal. Yeah. And then mice were just fucking pumping them full of shit. <laughs> Free game. <laughs> Growing ear on their, their back. Eyes, see if they get better vision. Like. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's um Pretty it's wrong. inhumane. Go on, go on. <laughs> it's fair. Um, where are we? Oh, I've lost my. There we go. Sorry. The mice um were then given human stem cells to test cell regeneration, to which showed positive results, which ex- which is uh, extremely promising for those uh, who stuttered. Oh, clearly, it's bloody me out there. Those who uh those who stutter. <laughs> my question is uh, again another huge tangent here. Um, I was going to ask, have you guys ever had a habit that you sort of personally realised is fucking annoying like a like a stutter for example um we can flip that over to what's your biggest pet hate we can flip that over to what's your favorite movie <laughs> <laughs> doesn't make any sense have you got like a real pet hate cam or or like a annoying habit right? yeah, yeah but... not necessarily that you do could be something you do but um something I, that, uh... don't know if you've seen me in the room but I, i'm always like i'm real twitchy yeah, I, I did notice like, that before. Yeah. yeah, I don't know if it's OC, I don't know if it's OCD or whatever. I've, I've, oh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> drug free sport, man. <laughs> Cocaine and dentist? No, no. <laughs> nah, but yeah, I've always had like a little twitch, even from when I was like, two or three or whatever. Mm. My mum's always noticed. I always like do weird shit, but mm. and it's nothing like I don't know if it's been diagnosed, but I just yeah always twitch and yeah, yeah. weird stuff in my face all the time. So you have a bit of a twitch. Um, do you have a twitch? No, I bl- I blow m- out with my nose. All the time. Oh like, yeah. I like, like just when I'm sitting on the couch, I don't know why I do it. It's yeah, like subconscious. Oh, and I clear my throat every oh. fucking twenty seconds. Have you guys noticed man. that? <laughs> no. He's always got a. Oh yeah. His throat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so strange. It's yeah. Uh, I mean, that's. But other than that, I'm pretty much a perfect human. Yeah. On that. Yeah. On, that <laughs> on that. Before I before I forget, pet hate people that chew with their mouth open. Uh, Can't yeah. handle it. It's yep. just rude. It's a weird. I wonder why. You wouldn't like Asia, mate. <laughs> oh, no, that's why I won't care. Hey. 
<laughs> full squats and uh, chilling with the mouth open. That's it, mate. <laughs> what about you, Joyce? Uh, habits. I tend to sit like this. Obviously, people listening to the podcast can't see, but I always tend to lean on one side sitting in any given conversation for some reason, mm-hmm. either left or right. It's pretty bizarre. And the arm has to follow. Yeah, okay. Yeah. The arm's kind of tucked in in yeah, a weird yeah, way. You have to bend your arm like that. I, I consciously go, no, nah, I'll sit straight. And then like five minutes later, I'll end up on one end. Yeah. I think yeah. I probably... On the other. Just to naturally stretch your QLs, stretch your glutes out. <laughs> You're, right. a, you're a thinker. It's Actually, a I'm weird. that annoying person in the movies that can't sit still. Oh, man. If I sit in front of you in the movies, you're going to have a bad time. Yeah. So I sing Plus, down, you're not going to be able to sit straight. This big fat head in a way. Yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you drive a, a double decker bus around? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, that, was, uh, that was a good band of science, gents. Very good. Thank you. Nice. Good work. Thanks very much for listening, guys. Uh, Don't forget, if you liked it, and even if you didn't like it, subscribe to us on iTunes. All of our show notes can be found at www.adventurefittravel.com forward slash podcast for any links or any exciting things that you guys may have picked up from that episode. As always, we'd like to thank our sponsors. First one is Loxam Solutions, www.loxamsolutions.com.au. NDO SUPS. NDOSUPS.com.au and Audible Trial, www.audibletrial.com forward slash ADVF radio. And lastly, Adventure Fit Travel uh, can be found at www.adventurefittravel.com. Bye. Discovery Roger, go for deploy.